My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Kahn on Twitter or at JeffreyCahn.com. Bits, bytes, and barrels. So, I'm looking for heroes in my career these days. <clears throat> I'm looking for companies that inspire me. I'm looking for companies that are magnets for talent. I'm looking for companies who aspire to a bigger, broader agenda. And I'm hopeful that someone in this room will take some inspiration from my remarks and set out to transform your organizations uh, for a more digital age. So I call this presentation Bits, Bytes, and Barrels. Years ago, I would have given presentations that might have been about bits and bytes, the digital side of the world. And sometimes I give presentations just on barrels, what's going on in the oil industry. But for the first time in a very, very long time, the intersection of these two industry sectors is now so impactful that it's creating an entirely new narrative for those of us in the industry. And so I call it bits, bites, and barrels. What I want to talk about today is, is to give you, we've had some great presentations so far the, this morning, but what I want to talk about is how do you make digital real? You're going to go back to your offices, and to be honest, I was saying to uh, George, who I'm sitting beside uh, this morning, I said, this is a bit of an echo chamber of really bright, educated people who are already digitally switched on. You wouldn't be in this room, frankly, if you weren't already switched on and a little bit jazzed about the idea of using digital and data in better ways. So you're just, a, you're just talking to your own echo chamber, to be blunt. So you need to go back to your offices with a different message. And what I want to do is give you some of the words for you to take back. What is digital? Why is this happening? Why is it happening at the pace that it's happening? What are the building blocks that underpin digital? And, why are, and how are they changing? And at what pace are they changing? Because if you can understand digital change, exponential change, you can, you can get, engage people in a different way. Anybody here golf? I mean, it's not great golfing conditions today in Calgary. We shouldn't be golfing. But anybody here golf? Yeah, how many of you think, if I said to you, I need you to hit a, a, a shot 30 yards out, would you know what club to use? Show of hands. You're going to pace off 30 yards. Let's pace off 30 exponential steps right now. First exponential step is one foot. Second one is two feet. Third one is four feet. The next one is eight feet. I can't get to eight feet in one stride. i got to go over to here. Next one is 16. How many is 30 yards exponentially? Something like 16 times around the world. Most of us can easily say, hey, 30 yards. I can get 30 yards in my head. It's a linear thing. But when you start talking about things that are changing exponentially, it kind of defies your imagination. How many of you can imagine going around the world 14 times? That's the speed of change of digital and why it's happening so quickly. What I want to do is give you a framework to think about it. The role of in the Internet of Things, the role of artificial intelligence, the role of robotics, where does blockchain fit in? That way you can kind of go back to your work and say, all right, I can think I can piece some, some of the puzzle together. I want to show you where digital is going to impact the industry first. And by the way, it's in the technology companies, which is why you're in this room. And then it is the services companies, because your cycle time is so much faster, you can adopt technologies much better. Then it is the retail industry in oil and gas, because the automakers are behind the service companies building new kit. And then it is the exploration and production companies, because your assets are so long life. And then the ones that are slowest to change are the pipelines. And that's because they're structurally disincented to innovate. They have to pass on the costs to you, which you reject. So guess what? They don't innovate too rapidly. So that's, I'm going to show you that time arc so that you can see where and how digital will arrive. There's a number of digital technologies that are combining in new and creative ways. I'm going to give you several case examples of things that you can actually go and see and touch today about how digital innovation is impacting the upstream oil and gas industry. I'm not going to talk about banking. I'm not going to talk about other sectors. Upstream oil and gas. Companies here in Calgary. 
And then finally, I want to touch on what the new business models are. The biggest stay awake issue, if you're sitting as a, a oil and company executive today, what you're really, really worried about is that some upstart's going to up and invent a, t a different kind of business model that will upend your entire business. And what I want to share with you is five different, six different business models in motion today that have the effect of upending the oil and gas industry. Because they're coming. Does that sound like fun? You only need the edge of your seat to sit to, to for a presentation like this. So enjoy the edge of your seat. What is digital? There's one right there. The easiest way to think of something which is digital is that it combines three things. It has to have data. It has to have some analytic horsepower to process or work with that data. And it needs some ability to connect to other like digital things, a communications capability. Every single one of us is carrying, I don't have mine with me, but there's smartphones. You all got smartphones? Smartphones, classic example. It's got a processor in there. It's got your address book. It's got your calendar. And it's got the ability to communicate to other smartphones. Same thing with smartwatches. You might say, well, that's fine, but what about my wells? Well, guess what? Your wells can be connected to other like-minded wells. They already are. Frack spreads can be connected to other frack spreads. Cloud computing is just that watch up and up and connected to a browser. That smart watch has the same horsepower, has the same horsepower as a Cray supercomputer from just 10 years ago. Think about it. How many of your employees are walking around with a Cray supercomputer on their wrist and you don't have a purpose for that in your business model? You got to ask that. You just got to wonder what, how. how and they carry them around for free. The single greatest penetration rate of Apple technologies in North America is in Alberta. This is where their best penetration rates are. Do you know why that is? Because we're so bloody rich. We can afford Apple Kit. How many of us are taking advantage of that? Not enough would be my argument. So those are the three devices. These are the building blocks. Data, analytics, and communications. And the reason why they're growing so rapidly is because the fab factories that manufacture the chips, once they get running, they get running. And every year they churn out another billion and another billion and another billion. And pretty soon the price falls to a point where it's practically free. Let me give you just a couple of examples. Between 2015 and 2016, IBM estimates that 90% of all the data ever, look at my phone, my, even my phone is ringing. Shall we answer? Let's not do that. 90% of all the data ever recorded was recorded just in those two years. In all of human history, just in two years. Where did it all go? It's up in the cloud. Most of it pictures of cats. <laughs> Northwest Refining, the new uh, oil refinery, 25,000 sensors on that plant. 25,000 sensors outstripping the plant's ability and the man, our people's ability to process uh, that kind of uh, information flow. Next on analytics, I mentioned my, my, my supercomputer on my wrist. Most of your employees are carrying supercomputers in their pockets. The numbers of sensors is going to grow and grow and grow. And the reason is very simple. The fab factories are churning them out. The beautiful part about them is they're low power. They're low power. You don't have to have high powered a connectivity out to uh, devices now. They will be wearable, they'll be on your clothing, they'll be in your hats. Low cost, low power, high capacity, fantastic performance. It's coming. Last is communications. When the internet first got going, we would be able to transmit one terabyte of data per month. We now do that per second. Per second. That's a six million times growth rate, by the way. Six million times. Just in the space of just a few years. And it shows no end insight. And they all come down to the same one phenomenon, the silicon chip. Because once you can put software and code, data and communications onto that one chip, you can uh, wire up the world. The reason why the network effect is so important is because it's a exponential and factorial math drive the value of the connectivity. This is why the Netflixes of the world, the Apples, the Amazons, the Alphabets, this is why these companies are so fantastically valuable, is that if you added up the connectivity paths between different nodes on a network, you get phenomenal, phenomenal connection potential. So one of, the, one of the orthodoxies of oil and gas is that we put our arms around our infrastructure and we keep the rest of the world out. 
That is not the way of digital. The way of digital is you embrace and you create the network because of the connectivity effect that you get. I'm going to talk about this in a, in a few minutes when we talk about new business models. Where is digital impacting oil and gas? There are four vectors. Four. Stephanie showed two this morning. I want to talk about two more. So the first one is supply of oil and gas is going up. If you apply artificial intelligence, machine learning, and other technologies of this kind to rechange the, the decline curves on both existing um, conventional wells and more importantly on the shale resources and the tight resources to make them look more and more like conventional gas wells, you will unlock or we, the world will unlock a further 5% of reserves. So what is 5%? 500 billion barrels. We cannot burn 500 billion barrels of oil and gas equivalent and maintain a Paris Climate Accord uh, agenda to keep global warming within a reasonable tolerance. We can't do it. So if you add that much supply into a market and you have an agenda which is to prosecute a, a different climate agenda, we might not agree with it here, but I can tell you if you're in China and India and Europe, they're very focused on the climate agenda. The world will not be decided by what Albertans think. It's going to be decided elsewhere. But if you add that kind of um, pro uh, oil and gas uh, production into global markets and you keep all things uh, equal, price will go down. Supply up, price will go down. Stephanie highlighted how demand is under um, threat of change because of electric cars and the plastic planet and um, industry 4.0. So you can anticipate that the demand will start to flatten out and go down. Will it go away? Probably not. We still need plastic, but will it Will it come back? The signposts suggest no. So where does that leave us? We're in the middle. If you've got supply up and demand down and you're in the middle producing, you've got one and only one agenda. You've got to lower your costs and you've got to get your productivity up. Every avenue, every potential, every nook and cranny, every rock, every ounce of energy in this industry needs to go into those same two equations. Because we do not control the supply. Our big neighbors south of the border have changed the game for that. And we cannot control the demand. The only thing we can control is what we can control. So it's those two elements in the middle. So it's about productivity and it's about cost. Um, if you're old enough, you might remember Bugs Bunny. Anybody here remember Bugs Bunny cartoons? Yeah, a few hands up. If you're too young, you won't get this analogy. But for the old guys and gals in the room, you can lean over to those young people and go, yeah, it was really funny in its day. Do you remember the cartoons where Elmer Fudd would have a keg of gunpowder under his arm and he's racing away from Bugs Bunny and Bugs drops the match onto the trail of gunpowder and then Elmer Fudd has to race furiously off? Do you remember those bits? Happened with uh, Wiley Coyote and the, uh, the Roadrunner and so forth. All right, so imagine that keg. That's how big is the bang when that gunpowder goes off? That's the size of the impact. Usually non-terminal if you're in a cartoon land. And then the amount of gunpowder trailed out behind you, that's the fuse. So the question is, how long is the fuse and how big is the bang going to be? How much time do we have before digital really affects our industry? And how big is the impact going to be? The fuse and the bang, the gunpowder and the fuse. This is a little two by two matrix. I used to be a consultant, I still am. So I get to work and think in, in simple analogies, but here's a two by two structure. Um, the left hand axis and the vertical axis is the, is the bang and on the right hand, the, uh, the horizontal axis is the length of the fuse. Stuff that's gonna be impacted really, really quickly. Big bang, short fuse, Digital assets like phones, consumer oriented and things with light volume. And the reason for that is because you don't need as much infrastructure to make change happen really quickly. And that's why we see it happening in banking. Mm -hmm. But if you go over to the long fuse side, this is our world. Physical assets, real assets, long dated contracts, long investments, regulatory process, steel, cement, land. These things take time. And that's why when you ask in the room, who all is doing digital transformation? Digital has been around for eight or nine years. Not very many hands go up. That's the reason. We're in the world of physics, cement, steel, long contracts. Can't change that stuff overnight. 
So it's going to take longer to get there. And the bang isn't going to be as big, despite the fact that there is this you know, view that, hey, this is going to totally overwhelm my industry. Not true. Not true, in my view. People are paying us for the molecule. They want a carbon and four hydrogen if they want methane. That's what they want. And no amount of digital is going to change that molecule into something super valuable. It might at the edge and the margin, but people still want the molecules. And that's why digital is not going to fundamentally overhaul the industry. But will it make us a lot more efficient? Absolutely. But the molecules are not going away. Not going away. Now, here's a little arc to give you a sense as to why, and if you went back to the previous chart and then overlaid where you sit in the industry. The reason why I have the technology companies up at the top is because software can be developed so quickly. So software changes really fast. This company sponsoring our session today, Acerna, that can turn out new software for us way faster than our ability to adopt it. So digital changes quickly. So technology companies, they're going to be, they're the size of the, the, uh, the fuse for them. The fuse is really short. The bang is really big. Really, really big. If you compete with a CERNA today, you've got problems because they're, they're on a pathway to develop the end-to-end -end answer to how to do this, right? So you're, 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 in, you're in competitive uh, challenge if, you, if you're competing with the technologies uh, that you can see out in the lobby today. So technology companies are the ones, <clears throat> they're the ones that are going to feel the change um, first. Next are the services companies. Field services. You got rigs running around, you're, you're uh, doing downhole work. You're going to feel the change next. And the reason for that is because your capital turns over quickly and you can buy technology. And the instant, minute the service company competing with you has invested in new technology, you've got to keep up. So you're going to invest. So services companies are next. The fuse is going to be particularly big on the services companies. The fuse is going to be long, uh, not too long, and the, and the bang is going to be quite big. Next are the retailers. I was at a conference. I was advising the International Energy Agency a year and a bit ago on the impact of digital on oil and gas. At the front of the stage was a super major. I can't tell you who because of Chatham House rules. But he said, you know what? We think retail is obsolete. This is a global super major. They have thousands and thousands of gas stations. They said, we think our retail stations are obsolete. I'm going to show you why in a second. Retail is going to feel it next. And it's going to be driven by the auto industry, driving cars, uh, that, which are connected and autonomous and shared and so forth and electric. But most importantly, this is the big shift, fuel delivery to your car. In the same way that Amazon has gotten into Whole Foods, to deliver, uh, uh, take the Amazon business model to deliver goods to your house. What happens when you can deliver fuel directly to your car, right? Why would you ever stop into a convenience store again? Want to see the canary in the coal mine? Ask Ontario Lottery Corporation how their lottery ticket sales are going with the next generation down. You know what they're going to tell you? We can't even see millennials in lottery ticket sales. They don't come into our retail stores. Don't come into retail. They're the next. Next after that is exploration and production companies. And the reason for that is your assets are long life. Once you put your infrastructure in place, you can't easily change it. Therefore, your investments in digital are going to be more protracted, take more time. As I mentioned last but not least, it's the midstream companies. Now, let me tell you about how, if you go back to your office, how does digital get done? So if you're now in that mix, where is digital fit for you? Let me just walk you through a few elements. This is about data. I'm not the first person to stand in front of the, the, this audience this, today and tell you that this is a data game. But digital is about data. It's about data. The Internet of Things, remember all those sensors I talked about going from 8 billion to 20 billion? They're generating torrents and torrents and torrents of data, and it's not going away. It's never going to reverse. It's only going in one direction. More and more data, heaps of it. What's our next problem? Excel can't process the amount of data we've got. Anybody here have Excel in your company? I want to talk a little bit about Excel spreadsheets. There's an oil company I've spent a bit of time with. Month end process, 450,000 spreadsheets that they currently have working together to produce their month end results. 
450, Excel is not going to be able to do the job when we add billions and billions of sensors. We're going to have to move to a different tool set, and it's going to be artificial intelligence and machine learning. Next, robots and automation, autonomous wells. There's a reason why Suncor has autonomous haulers. Yes, part of it is about replacing some humans who drive vehicles. We're prone to intoxication and revelry, but that's not the reason why they're doing it. The reason they're doing it is because Rio has put the heavy haulers into the mining industry and showed that it could be done. But Rio has also put into place an autonomous train. Did you know that? You can actually haul iron ore in the Pilbara in Western Australia from mine face to the coast 500 miles by an autonomous train, no train drivers. Have you been to Singapore? There are autonomous ports there. Lights out ports. Lights go off at night, but the ports still frantically moving containers around. The ports are running in the dark with no people involved. There are ghost ships sailing the seas today, taking cargoes to market. The large industrial companies are putting all the pits and pieces into place to create the commodity industry of the future that starts with Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and robotics, end to end, to remove people out of the mix and raise a higher order set of analysis to run those businesses. There's a reason why entrepreneurs today are saying things like, I'm going to go to asteroids and mine them. They're not saying that because they, they uh, have a, it's a, a sort of a crazy notion. You can start to see the pieces falling into place where you can do that. Send robots to asteroids to extract those ores. We're not going to send humans to asteroids. Elon might send people up to Mars, but I would send robots if I could. Get the ore bodies out. So if we're going to go after those resources, it'll be the robots. So if the Internet of Things generates the data and artificial intelligence interprets the data and the robots apply the data to do work, then cloud computing is the only real animal where you could actually store all of this data. So it's got to sit in the cloud somewhere. Most of us are not going to be able to stand up data centers that can hold the amount of information that's going to be coming off of, of our devices in the future. So cloud computing is critical. If you're not on the cloud today or you don't have an agenda to be on the cloud, you are not playing in a digital era. This is table stakes, because none of this other stuff works. Then you just won't have the ability to stand up the horsepower to do it. Where does blockchain fit in? Blockchain creates trust. Blockchain creates trust. It removes the ability from someone to tamper with the data, fudge the analysis, and create a different data flow off of a device that's incorrect. We learned this from Volkswagen. The diesel scandal, when those cars began, were tampered with, what blockchain could have done was prevent the engineers from tampering with the data and the sensors on the cars to queer the pitch around how the uh, sensors generated information associated with carbon emissions. Blockchain locked down the devices and the data coming off those devices so that it cannot be tampered with. What does this do for you if you can do this? Remember that, I think it was, uh, was it Mitchell? Is Mitchell here? Where are you? No, too bad. Mitchell said on stage, the biggest issue we've had is getting trust over our data. It took a whole year, right? Blockchain creates the trust over the data. There's a story about Porsche in the news. Automobile, anybody drive a Porsche here? I don't. Any Porsche drivers? No, no, I'm willing to admit that. <laughs> A little tough, yeah, a little tough in Calgary to be buying Porsches. Porsche has been running a blockchain trial for the last six months. Porsche's cars in 2020 will be blockchain nodes. Cars will be on blockchain. Why would they do that? Why would you put a car on blockchain? Imagine you've gone to Chinook Center, you've parked your car in that bloody great underground parking lot, and it's at the far end on the on the south side, and you're shopping up at the north side at at uh, 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 one of the uh, kitchen shops, and you've, you've purchased a huge and expensive mix master. And now you've got to lug that damn thing down to your car. Wouldn't it be great if you could, with your phone, submit a contract, create a contract, to authorize a store agent to go down to your car 
And when they get to the car, their phone talks to the car, opens the trunk, they put it into the trunk, close the lid. Wouldn't that be great? That would be great. I could then not have to stop my shopping and, and make multiple trips. I could just get people in the stores to deliver goods. Coming to Porsche in 18 months. Blockchain smart contract. What could you do if you put a blockchain smart contract on a car beyond just opening and closing doors? You could pay for fuel. You could pay insurance. You could pay road tolls. You could pay parking. As your car drives into the parking lot, smart contract opens up, writes off to the cloud, so-and-so's car is going into this parking lot. When you leave, the smart contract closes. PayPal pays your account. Your car is paid. Science fiction? 2020. Coming to cars. If you're buying a new car in 2020, you're going to be a crypto and uh, cryptocurrency enthusiast because as you're using your car, your car is going to be generating cryptocurrency for you. Think about that. If you could do that to cars, could you do it to frack spreads? Drill rigs, sand haulers, water trucks, service companies of all kinds. Why not? So if you want to inspire the next generation of young people, you've got to be like a Porsche. You've got to go, you know what? I think we can do this. Why would you not do that? Blockchain. Underneath that, enterprise systems. You might not like this message, but those of us who have invested in systems like SAP and Oracle and so forth, we're in a much better position because it's all about data. And the enterprise systems of the world are the masters at managing large, complex data uh, flows and transactions. So it is about um, ERP systems. Above that, and no one really talks about this, but this is one of the most interesting elements of digital. How many software releases does Amazon do in a year? Anybody have a hazard to guess? Software releases by Amazon in a year. Remember, they've, you know, all of their shopping and so forth. Any ideas? 50 million. That's 1,800 a minute, in case you're wondering. How many of your companies have issued a software update for your employees at all today? Probably not. Maybe one or two. 50 million. In order to do digital, you have to rethink how you roll stuff out, because it is going to have to happen at a much faster pace. Agile, the user experience. If users are not able to engage, I mean, how many of you use Uber? Anybody here use Uber? Yeah. When have you, how many of you took the Uber training course, the two-day online intensive where you have to go off-site and study how Uber? No, none of us did. How many took a training course to use Airbnb? How many of us took a training course to use Google? Next generation technologies don't need training. Oil and gas is still hung up on some of the older ideas, which is, oh, the job's going to be really hard. I'm going to have to train people. No, this is, digital doesn't get done that way. Digital gets done differently. You don't have to train people. Your next generation workforce is not being trained by you. They're being trained by Google, Airbnb, and Uber to get into the workforce and not have to be trained to just do the job. That's the expectation. So it's about agile and user experience. And finally, last but not least, and I put this at the top of this framework for this reason, this is fundamentally a people question. You've heard it earlier. Culture, change management, new skill sets, data science. Why did Amazon not come to Calgary? Anybody know? Talk to Calgary Economic Development, they'll tell you. Amazon called eight minutes after when they said, we're going to start, we, we made the decision on such and such a day and time, eight minutes later, they called Calgary Economic Development and said, sorry, you're not going to get the gig. Eight minutes. That's how highly they thought of the bid. Okay? They didn't call us because we were C's, A, B's, and C's. No, no, no. They called us because they cared about our bid. They told us, your bid was great. However, we need 1,000 data scientists on day one. Your city does not produce any data scientists. Your education systems, your workforce, not trained for the technology of the future. So if we're going to participate in a more digital world, 
we're going to have to deal with this question. And this is why SAGE and the University of Calgary are feverishly trying to overhaul their programs today to create next generation skill set to be able to participate in this world so we don't have another Amazon. There's many digital technologies that play a role in providing the performance um, opportunity that I've talked about, costs and productivity gains. On the wearable side, data farms, fleet training. By the way, um, when you're driving your Tesla, and I don't know if any of you have a Tesla, but if you drive a Tesla, your Tesla is training all of the other Teslas how to drive. You want to make sure you're a good driver because you're teaching all of your bad habits to the other cars. No, you're not. Tesla is sorting all that stuff out. Fleet learning. If you've got more than one piece of equipment in your kit, or if you're embracing or working with a whole range of, of uh, technologies, why wouldn't you start asking your suppliers to get that kit to start training the other kit? That's how Tesla is doing this. They're creating this notion of fleet learning where machines teach other machines. They're way faster at it than we are. So fleet learning. Next is maintenance data. I'll come into this in a second. Blockchain trading. There's a company called VAKT, VAKT out of uh, Europe. So this is a, uh, a consortium of banks, oil companies, midstream companies, tank farms. By the end of this year, they will turn on a blockchain-based petroleum purchasing and sales engine. Because in Europe today, in the ARA, that's the Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Antwerp area, if you're buying, selling, and trading in petroleum products, it takes 60 to 90 days to settle, to settle. Blockchain turns that into seconds. I'll give you an example of this in a second with uh, NAL resources. Other big technologies out there, things that are, I keep an eye on, 3D printing. 3D printing will not have as much effect in oil and gas, in my view. The biggest effect of 3D printing, though, is with people who make stuff and ship it around the world, so shoe companies and so forth. And they're going to start using 3D printing to remove their carbon emissions from the, the atmosphere. That way, they're not shipping goods around as much as they're shipping a raw material, and they make the good at sight. The IEA and other um, industry monitors estimate that 3D printing is the sleeper. It's the technology that has the greatest potential to undermine and transform manufacturing supply chains. And oil and gas is a big input into manufacturing supply chains. So keep an eye on 3D printing. I'll talk a little bit about drones, an example from Australia. Gamification. Likes, shares, thumbs up, pats on the back, badges, all of the stuff that the next generation has grown up with, playing with phones, why would you not be implementing that at work? Why not? Likes, badges, um, uh, shares, all of that sort of gamification stuff that makes people feel good about their job. The next generation down is quite used to this now. So if you want to kind of engage them, uh, bringing that kind of technology into your everyday business systems makes a lot of sense. And then finally, up in, as I mentioned earlier, agile, not just agile rollout, like how do you roll out things in a very, very rapid way, but how do you develop things in an agile way will require new and different skill sets. For a client uh, recently, they, they had asked um, where, uh, who is uh, world class in this and which industries are further ahead. And I mentioned earlier this, the fuse and the bang, so long fuse, big bang. Here's just a bit of analysis that shows uh, which industries are actively supporting um, which and uh, investing in which technologies. And I've divided this up by uh, extraction, transportation, refining, and sales. And then on the support side, it's finance, HR, supply chain, uh, bit training, and so forth. Um, and this was just a survey of 30-odd sources, uh, publications, where those authors were discussing the uh, application of these technologies. Uh, in those different parts of oil and gas. And these were some of the leaders. Internet of Things in extraction, uh, transportation, refining. Very, very uh, hot topic. Getting data, getting the data. Uh, CC is cloud computing. AI is artificial intelligence. And as you can see, I've sorted the charts to get the bubbles to the top so you can see which ones are most uh, relevant. But transportation and maintenance are the ones most active in adopting digital innovations. Transportation and uh, maintenance. Oil and gas has a lot of maintenance. We do a lot of maintenance. So there's lots of organizations out there tr doing things with, in maintenance, maybe not in oil and gas, but in other industries. This is a hot area. So if you're not applying digital innovation and maintenance, this is a what I would call low-hanging fruit at this stage. I mentioned earlier what bothers boards, if you talk to uh, boards and executives, what keeps them awake at night is the rise and the potential of new business models. I want to talk about six new business models. 
Number one, resource value. What happens when small resource companies pool their data, put it up into the cloud, and shove it into an artificial intelligence engine? AI loves data. The more, the better. And the problem with small resource companies is you have small data holdings. Large companies, large data holdings. If small oil and gas companies want to take advantage of all of this horsepower and leverage it, one of the ways to do it is to get your damn data into the cloud, pool it, and then shove it into the AI engines and have the engines help interpret it. Resource value. What this does is it allows small oil and gas companies to compete on an equal, put in, uh, equal footing in interpretation with large super majors. You might say, bullshit, I don't believe that. At the same IEA conference where I was at, same super major was talking, said we ran an experiment, two-stage experiment. Stage one, could cloud computing process our subsurface and seismic information so we don't have to have our own data center? And number two, could we crowdsource the interpretation? So they ran the study and came back with two positive conclusions. Take, just keep put, put this away, just kind of park this thought. Number one, cloud computing, think Amazon, Google, Microsoft, IBM, robust enough now to process seismic data in the cloud. Number two, the crowd is as good as your geologists at interpreting the data. I don't know if you just felt the earth move a little bit right there, but that's what they said. Their conclusion, they can crowdsource interpretation of subsurface data as well as their internal geologic resources. What happens when the crowd outside figures this out? They turn this into algorithms, they put it up in the cloud, and they call it an AI for rent engine. So small oil and gas companies will no longer be constrained by their size. This is not going to be a constraint because of size. It'll be a constraint because of imagination. It's a different problem. So resource values changing. Number two, apps for fuel delivery. I mentioned this. This makes, imagine if you could pick up, a, we're sitting right here, you get on your phone right now and go, shoot, you know what, I, I'm, how much fuel's in my car? Do you know? I, would, I wouldn't know but you might be able to query your car and go, how much fuel do you have? Okay, let me just get this fuel app and get some fuel delivery to my vehicle. That's all coming. That's all the happening in, in Asia now. It's gonna to come to North America. With that service and capability, where is retail? For a different question, if you can do that for retail, that's just a liquid in a tank, right? Tank happens to be a car, but it's just a liquid in a tank. How many of us have tanks on properties with say chemicals in them? You put the sensors on those tanks and then you run, manage that in a much more sophisticated fashion. That's what manufacturers do. Number three is Moby. Remember I told you about Porsche? Porsche published the results of their study. Moby is an alliance of European automakers who have said, we better not allow one blockchain structure for every auto company. Why don't we get together and have one blockchain company for all automakers? That's what Moby is. It includes BMW and Mercedes and Volkswagen, okay? Announced shortly after the Porsche trials. Transforming how you think about cars. Next one, asset ownership. In a world where the data is really, really important, you can use blockchain for things like registering usage and consumption and so forth, what happens to the whole idea of asset ownership? The next generation of kids coming up may not ever own a car. They go to car to go or they go to Uber. There's a service in Finland today called WIM, W-H-I-M. You might want to go take a look at it. It's very, very disturbing. For one low charge of 90 euros a month and a little card, you can buy all the transportation you can consume for a month, for 90 euros. All the Uber rides you can possibly drive, all of the rental bikes you might want, all of the taxis, your bus fares, your subway fares, your ferry services, all in the Helsinki area. WIM integrates all of these services into a single platform. Next generation might not want to own a car. I don't know if that's alarming to you, but if you sell fuel to cars, it might be. So transforming that. Last, next one is financial assets. What happens when you do things like creating using the data coming off of a car because you've been driving it around and it generates data. 
Could, how do you, what do you do with that data? Couldn't you monetize that? These digital assets create value in ways that we don't quite anticipate. Last one was on robotics. And I mentioned the digital, um, the uh, robot and the haulers. What happens if you took haulers, shovels, conveyor systems, rail, um, oh, crushers, washers, and bitumen separation units, and you could digitize that end to end. Instead of having them digitize the stovepipes, you digitize the whole thing. You could create a digital mine. A digital mine, something you can see end to end. Today, you can only see uh, this piece, and then you see this piece, and then you see this piece, and you can't uh, optimize it. But could you create a digital version of that end to end? Yes. That's what's, that's what's behind that one. Here's some case examples of real life um, illustrations of how these technologies, if you combine them in new and creative ways, create inter really interesting value. Uh, NAL, which is a resources company here in Calgary, bolted together an AI engine, a robot, a bot, as Stephanie mentioned earlier, and finally a, a blockchain structure, which allowed them to take the royalty stream from the, their joint venture partners, the way they have to pay a royalty, and eliminated the disputes. Next one is Shell and their drones. Shell flies drones over their gas wells in Australia. The reason they do this is because when they were, instead of Stephanie had the story about, was it Stephanie or Mitchell? Someone had the story this morning about sending the operator and they do the circuit, they just do the circuit and they just go visit the wells and then that hasn't changed. Shell flies a drone over their wells in Australia and the drone inspects the wells from the air. It can pick up when kangaroos have banged into the flare stack it can pick up when there's uh, encroachment of vegetation, when it's been flooded. It can pick up, uh, read the sensors from the air. That drone flies 150 kilometers a night. It can look at 10 times the number of wells that an operator can driving around. 10 times. They've tied that to their land system, their ERP system, and they auto pay the, um, the uh, as they collect the data, auto drive the work orders and work instructions. And the last one I mentioned this was the GE, uh, last example is GE and their turbine business. Any company that is selling a technology into an oil and gas company, if you can convert that from a physical asset that your oil company has to buy to a rental asset they pay as an OPEX, and you can extract the data off of that, you can create a subscription or a model or business model where the, your company, if they're capital constrained, don't have to put capital in. They would love that. Banks would finance this if you could guarantee the cash flows coming off of it in a, slight, in a different way, which you can do with things like artificial intelligence. New and creative models. Remember I said that, that the centerpiece of this framework is data? So it's, this is about data. Your data wants to be free. This is why it's so easily copied. It wants to be free. So underpinning all of this is this underlying question, what do you do with your data? Do you continue to harbor it and protect it? Or do you let it be free? Do you let third parties process and interpret the data? And in a world where Internet of Things and AI and so forth are generating torrents and torrents and torrents of data, the probability a smaller company can interpret all of their own data is very low. So a really interesting question is, how do you create a different way of thinking about your own data assets so that you can participate in this more digital um, future? Here's five things that you can do to, to, uh, to uh, um, start your own digital journey or get your digital journey moving in your own organization. Number one, set your digital North Star. Rio's digital North Star is, we're going to open up an unmanned automated mine, underground automated mine in five years. That's their digital North Star. An unmanned, fully automated, underground mine. That's their digital North Star. Do the technologies exist that even get them there? No, of course not. They're going to have to go and invent that. But that's what ecosystems do. They love to invent that kind of stuff. So what is your digital North Star? There's the first question. What do you aspire to be? And remember, remember my analogy, 30 yards versus 30 exponential steps? Your digital North Star has to be something quite a ways out because by the time you make even a few steps there, the world is up and changed. So you're aiming for something called a North Star. Number two, educate your organization. This echo chamber telling ourselves what, you know, all about digital, pointless. 
pointless. Unless you've got Harvey, that crusty old guy who's got his fingertips on that spreadsheet and will not let go. Unless you've got Harvey excited about this vision, this change agenda does not work. Does not work. So you gotta educate your organization. Next, business driven roadmap. Conversation this morning, how do you eat an elephant? One step at a time, one bite at a time. Start small, little innovations. Just talk to NAL. Just talk to NAL. How did they do it? It's just a little innovation. Just a little innovation. That's all it took. Small steps. Very focused on cost and productivity, by the way. This is not a science project. We do not have time. We do not have time. We've got to get this working now. So it's about little steps that make a difference now. Cost and productivity. Next is data acumen. If you've got data assets, I know you all do. Every company does. What is your acumen around data? Do you think about your data? Do you have, is your data an asset on your balance sheet? Do you, do you have your internal metrics that treat it like an asset? Or is it an OPEX item that's hidden under the CIO's budget and it only shows up as server's costs? Good question. If you're Google, you're definitely gonna be thinking about data in a much different way. And last but not least is to put the foundations in place, and that's things like cloud computing and ERP, and if you happen to be a well operator, it's how do you, how do you uh, make sure your wells have some technology integration so that they can communicate. Lots of companies solving this problem because it's not unique to Alberta. Everyone else seems to have an advertisement, so I think I'm gonna have a little advertisement. This is what I do, is I help companies, very, very short, very sharp, two days at a time, what is your digital roadmap? I offer these sorts of things. Board briefings, if you need to get your board on board because your board's not paying attention and they don't get it, you can get a guy like me to come in and have the same kind of conversation with your board. I do things like help if you have a digital roadmap. Does it make sense? Is it future proof? Where are others going with it? I look at your roadmaps and I can give you some pointers. How do you get your roadmaps uh, back in, uh, into a place where they're more valuable to you? Um, I have written a book about this topic. It'll be published in January 2019. Um, I just sent the copy last night for formatting. So it's ready, 80,000 words. And it's the, you saw the agenda, the uh, table of contents was, was the agenda of this presentation. So if you like this and you think this is inspiring, then I would ask you to keep an eye out for this book. Follow me on LinkedIn because you can see the progress of this uh, publication coming out. Subscribe to my blog, uh, download the podcast series. And uh, with that, I'll pause there and take questions. Thanks, everyone. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find more episodes of Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, and Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts, or just visit jeffreycan.com slash podcast for more. If you have a minute, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tell other people about the show. This helps them discover more great content. Later this year, Jeffrey will publish a book on the impacts of digital innovation on the oil and gas industry. You can keep track of this new project by following Jeffrey on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil and Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.